right, it is my privilege to present our next speaker, uh, Herr Professor Hermann Gaub, Chair of Applied Physics at the Ludwig Maximilians University of Munich. Professor Gaub has a remarkable history of pioneering innovations in probing molecular dynamics at the single molecular level. He, and he's advancing understanding of various macromolecular processes, including lipid anchoring in membranes, protein antibody interactions, DNA strand unwinding, and folding of bacterial rhodopsin into its membrane environment. His biomolecular toolbox includes such, te such techniques as atomic force microscopy, parallel format binding force assays, and the first man-made single molecule molder. Professor Gao began his professional development at the Technical University of Munich, uh, where he obtained his PhD, and then went on to postdoctoral studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and at Stanford, before returning to Munich, where he advanced in rank to his current position. He has an impressive publication record, regularly presenting his work in premier journals like Science, uh, PNAS, Biophysical Journal, Nature Cell Biology. He is a member of the Brandenburg Academy of Science and the Academy Leopoldina. He has won numerous achievement awards, including the Heisenberg Fellowship, the Max Planck Research Award, and the, Le the Leibniz Award, and the Small Times Award. It is my pleasure to present Professor Goh. words and for this flattering introduction. It's a great pleasure for me to be here. It's actually the first time for me in Cleveland and now since Andreas Engel is here, it's probably not the last time, so I tremendously enjoy it. <laughs> when I was asked for the title, I gave a very quick answer because I was just writing a paper and so that was the title of the paper and that was very quick. And that was single molecule cut and paste. But then later on I realized that I might probably torture you with this topic. And it's probably better to add two more other topics to what I'd like to explain to you, and this is probably better suited for what your interests are. Unfolding bacteria rhodopsin is a model system which might be interesting for you for all other kinds of membrane proteins, and what we learned there might actually be feasible for some of your studies. And the other thing is that if you really go into applying forces to molecules, and this is what we eventually do, ultimately do, then we might as well look into where are forces acting on molecules in a physiological boundary condition. And this is actually a big block, we, we realized. And so mechanoenzymatics of titan kinase might be something that interests you. Well, this is the tool that we predominantly use. And it is a very, very simple tool. It's basically nothing else than a little silicon bar. And this little silicon bar has a few microns in width, a few 10 microns in length, fractions of microns in thickness, and at the very end is a sharp tip. And at the very end of the sharp tip, you probably barely see it. There is an additional very, very thin, but very sharp tip, and that has a curvature radius, which is in the order of the size of a typical biomolecules, a few nanometers. So that means we start from silicon technology and build things that reach down to the level of individual molecules. Now the nice thing is that actually the flexibility of this bar is such that together with the precision of positioning such a tip, which is on the order of angstroms, we actually end up with forces that we can control and that we can apply, which are on the order of piconewtons. Now angstrom is something you got used to, but what's a piconewton? You have a feeling for a piconewton? Most likely not, huh? So you have a feeling for a newton. The weight of an apple, that's a newton. Now, how do we make a pica newton from the force of the weight of an apple? Typically, you do that with levers. So you take one lever arm, you make that from here to the moon. And then you make the small lever arm about that long. And on the small lever arm, you put the apple. And on the moon, you have a pica newton. Does that help you? 
doesn't help you either? Well, just take it. We can control it, and it's not that complicated. It's with doable means that we can control the positioning and that we can control the forces. We, can ju we just can't do it, so le leave that to us. Now, well, there are companies that sell, sell such instruments, so it's not much of a secret. Stefan Kufer, Elias Puchner, Hermann Gump, Matthias Strackhand, Stefan Stahl, and Tim Liedl, they actually started to address a question, how can we use such a device in order to handle single molecules and assemble something from scratch? And it actually goes back to a dispute which you might actually have realized a few years ago was actually fought in uh, Scientific American between Drexler and Smalley. And it started when right after the invention of the scanning tunneling microscope, Don Eigler et al., they actually built these wonderful structures from atoms at ultra high vacuum at ultra low temperatures. And that worked. But nobody succeeded in using this concept for molecules, although we would have loved to assemble larger structure from biomolecules. That was a clear dream, and those two disagreed on why it's not working. And we actually enjoyed this dispute quite a bit because the, the point was, well, these nanoscopic fingers that you use to transport molecule from molecule to build up something, they're sticky. So if you grab something, you won't be able to release it. We actually liked that because our concept was based on stickiness, but on a hierarchy of stickiness and a hierarchy on molecular interactions. And finally, we recently succeeded to really do it. And the concept is as follows. We have very, very elaborate techniques to produce molecular patterns on a micrometer length scale. You buy a DNA chip, and then you have on each of these spots a given sequence. You can actually decorate then each of these spots with a molecule or with a nanoscale unit or whatever you want to do by, by hooking a DNA sequence to it that hybridizes with this local sequence. So this is a way to make protein chips out of DNA chips well established. What we did is we actually added we extended this one oligo by another oligo. And now we did it such that we have here a hybridization in a geometry that if we apply a force along here, this here is unzipped, whereas this oligo here, which binds this unit now to our AFM tip, is actually feeling the force in a shear mode. Now here we have 30 base pairs, and here we have 20 base pairs. Nevertheless, if you apply a force, although thermodynamically this here is actually the more stable complex, this complex here will be unzipped. Because what happens is that hydrogen bond for hydrogen bond for hydrogen bond is actually broken, whereas here all the hydrogen bonds are loaded in parallel. All the energy here is actually dissipated over a short distance, here over a long distance, low force, high force. So if you pull on that thing, this here will open, and you can now transfer this unit, it hangs on your tip, over to an area where you want to build things. This is the target area. On the target area, you have exactly the same sequence, but in three prime instead of five prime uh, uh, anchoring here. So what it means if you come, then these here can hybridize again, but again now in shear geometry. Now you have a 30 mer and a 20 mer in shear geometry if you pull now, this one actually will open up. Now you have your cantilever DNA free again. You can move over and pick the next guy, bring it over, and start assembling. That's basically all. We have a hierarchy of forces, pick molecules, move them somewhere, and deliver them. That's the basis of it. Well, a little bit, I have to actually uh, I, it's, sorry, this is a really crowded uh, view graph. It's nothing else than a sketch of how the experiment looks like. It's a setup which combines two instruments, an AFM and a turf microscope. So what we can do is we can follow in an optical signal what happens at the interface here when we come from above with the AFM cantilever and manipulate now single molecules here. This is all in one optical axis, while a sample here can be moved in XY with, uh, with, with piezo elements. So what we can do here is manipulate molecules and monitor them optically in parallel. Now, what you see here is now an example of how we paste a single molecule. What we have is we have grabbed, by means that I just explained, a single DNA with a single fluorophore, 
have it now at the, M uh, at the AFM cantilever, move it over, and now we have here an evanescent field. This means when the cantilever tip comes down, the tip itself also penetrates the evanescent field and lights up in the red channel. When the tip moves back, it has deposited its molecule. The molecule stays there. This is now the fluorophore, and it lives for a while until it finally dies. So what you see here is we deposited the single molecule. It's doable. Nothing really weird. It's a robust technology. Can't do it only once. You can do it really often here. We wrote the name of the initiative that gave us money to do that, and so those are 5,000 fluorophores that were transferred this way. So it's a technology that you can use. Nothing weird, nothing fancy. The really nice part is the following. While we are doing this, we write a protocol on what the forces were when we picked up these molecules. So if we have now this geometry here, where we have this unzip against the shear geometry, and we measure the force while we pull the cantilever back and plot that here, then you see the force builds up until finally this shear geometry here can't hold it anymore, separates slightly, this is the distance versus the force, so it's, this is the unzipping, until it's free. However, sometimes we didn't really pick up anything, then we try it again until we're sure we have a molecule at the tip. Then if we deposit it, we again write a protocol. We measure the force when we pull back, and here, this is now the situation where we have all the bonds loaded in parallel, and they rupture all at once. That's a completely different characteristics. And again, if we couldn't uh, deposit a molecule, we do it again. So we have, while we do, the control and can always go back and get another molecule. That makes it actually quite nice. What can you do with it? Well, the first thing that one could start is thinking, can one employ this technology to create structures of fluorophores of well-defined geometry below the Abbe diffraction limit and find out whether super-resolution imaging, fluorescence imaging, can be quantified this way. You know that fluorescence microscopy has done tremendously in the last years. We've gained resolution with all kinds of tricks. And so since we can now observe individual fluorophores and can follow their fate, we have a chance of actually learning how we can discriminate between the individual ones. What you have been seeing here was actually a structure that we wrote below the diffraction limit, those are nine points, and we followed the intensity, the overall intensity over time, and you see those are discrete steps. Those are discrete steps because each of these steps is when one of these molecules dies. How do we reconstruct now where the position of these molecules was? Well, just make a time reversal. And in the time reversal, we go now along that line here. This we know is one single molecule. We can determine where actually the center of mass of this is. Then on the next step here, we have two molecules. Now if we subtract this intensity profile from this one, we know that what we see here is the second molecule. Well, we can do the same thing on the third molecule. We can say, do the same thing on the fourth molecule. And so we can subsec subsequently subtract the images one after the other because they died one after the other. And if we do so, then we can analyze where these dyes were. So this is actually the sequence. This is molecule number one. Molecule number two, if we do the difference, then this is this. Molecule number three, this the difference. And so we have now the positions of each of these molecules. And while we had actually planned to place them here in the middle of these squares, you see they weren't really deposited all in the middle. It also tells you the resolution at which we can now determine the position of this molecule is on the order of 10 nanometer or better, better. But the position at which we deposit them at the moment isn't so high. And the reason for this is we have long spacers on these DNA molecules. And that has technical reasons. This is not a principal point. And those spacers determine now at the moment what we can achieve as spatial resolution. In principle, the angstrom resolution of the AFM is a little bit too good, but on the nanometer is doable. What can we do with something like that? Well, obviously, what we'd like to do is assemble things at our will. Now, one way of doing it is a combination of self-assembly and directed assembly. So what we did here is we actually wrote a pattern. This is now a global leaf. We wrote a pattern of anchoring points. 
And these anchoring points were actually the picture that you've seen before. Oh, I'll go back again. Sorry. This, those are the anchoring points, the picture that you've just seen. And now what we did is we threw in fluorescent nanoparticles, which selectively bind now to these anchoring points in a self-organizing manner. And what we get now is this decorated. And you see they're actually black spots. If you look at the same thing with the AFM, you see it's a perfect pattern. What that means is it tells us not all of these fluorophores are, or if these fluorescent uh, nanoparticles actually are optically alive. Some of them are dyed. We learned that this way. But what we have here is now something where we can create plasma in hotspots. We can make use of the unique optical properties of such nanoparticles and bring molecules that we're interested in in their vicinity, enhance their spectral properties like surface enhanced ramen or whatever one wants to do. In any way, that's now a means of locally controlling these plasmon fields by arranging these particles in order to make certain field geometries. What have we learned? Molecule by molecule assembly in aqueous environment at room temperature works. It's a pretty robust technology. And a hierarchy of binding forces with DNA helps. It doesn't have to be in a DNA. It's just convenient for us. You can also use other molecular interactions for that. And the force curves, they're really a quite useful protocol. Where will we go? Well, something is clear. Enzymatic cascades can now be assembled at will. And so if you know that all what you've studied is the complex interaction between molecules regulating each other, and that life is nothing else than that, then what we can start is taking a few of these elements and placing them in a certain geometry. We can allow the products or the partners, the interaction partners, to diffuse two-dimensionally, three-dimensionally, one-dimensionally, and can make patterns where these molecules compete with each other and things like that. So the control of where we place a biomolecule will allow us to do things like that. Let's come to the next block. And the next block is one where we now employ our possibilities to manipulate molecules, to learn more about these molecules in a more or less destructive way. This is not that we probe the natural function of this protein. We use it as an analytical tool. And that's a project which was started in a very, very nice collaboration between our group, Philipp Oesterheld and Max Kessler. They collaborated with Daniel Müller and Andreas Engel, at that time both at the Biozentrum Basel. And we had the help of Dieter Oesterheld. And later on came Roland Netz and Helmut Grobmüller. They helped us with the theory. Now, the idea is now the following. Here we look more on the cut process than on the paste process. So can we cut a molecule out of the membrane that we've identified before? And what do we learn from doing so? So what they did is they imaged a purple membrane and then felt, yeah, this molecule is a good candidate. Then they went down and approached this molecule. And there are two ways of approaching it. Either they have here a specific group at one of the tails for example, a cysteine, and come down with a gold tip, then this is a specific bond. Or they just adhere one of these loops, which then makes the interpretation later on more complicated. So let's focus on the one where we have a specific attachment site. Upon pulling back, a force profile is recorded, and that has a lot of peaks. Then it's made sure, yes, one single protein was extracted from the surface. So what we see here is the result of this process here. They did that that many of these experiments, and if you plot them on top of each other, you start seeing a pattern which emerges, which has a certain regularity. And so the, proce the, the process itself is a little bit highlighted by this. No, just a second. No, why doesn't it do this? This is mean. <laughs> this is a movie. No, I hate it. <laughs> just a second. Huh. So, hey, hey. good. <laughs> so this is roughly how you can imagine how it works. So we are approaching this multi-helix protein, grab it at the end, and now this is stretched, the force builds up, until that helix unfolds and adds to the length of the backbone of this polymer now. The force drops because this polymer can actually now fluctuate. It acts like an entropy spring. The force drops. And so whenever you see a peak in the force curve, that means that this thing was stretched, was what was unfolded before. 
and that you then see a barrier against the unfolding in the protein. So each of these peaks here marks an unfolding barrier. And if we can now measure the position of this peak very carefully and precisely, we can calculate back on where in the protein this unfolding barrier is and reconstruct parts of the energy landscape in which this protein is folded. We learn more about uh, the potential width and spontaneous transition rates by looking in greater details at the rate dependence, but we don't do that here now. For, yeah. Ah, we come to that. Wonderful. More questions of that kind? <laughs> Keep them. <laughs> Good. So now the task is the following. What we have is something which is actually fluctuating. Mm, take this. We have, we have something which, is it still working? Yeah. We have something which is fluctuating. This is our polymer, and we stretch the polymer. What we'd love to know is what's the contour length, the stretched length, but what we have is only the length as a function of the force. So we need a model that describes us the elasticity of this backbone. And these, uh, this elasticity has actually two contributions. One contribution is this one entrop entropic contribution, excuse me, and the other contribution is already the backbone elasticity because the forces become pretty high. Backbone elasticity, we started to do ab initio. One can nowadays calculate the mechanics of a molecule by just solving quantum mechanically the equations for the, the, the uh, electron system and the nuclei. That can be done with ab initio techniques. We've done that. And if you do so, then you get an idea on if this is now the backbone of the protein that we're interested in. You get an idea on what the force and the length relates, and this is the elasticity. If you have that, you have already the one part. You need a second part that does the entropy, and this is each of these segments of the protein is allowed to rotate, and this rotation actually, actually then contracts the polymer, but this is what is fed by entropy. Altogether, the red curve is what we have as a completely without any free parameter from scratch calculated elasticity. And those dots here is a model peptide. You see there is slight deviation. We're working on this one. On the case of the DNA, we have that already pretty much perfect. There is not much of a difference anymore. So we understand this elasticity. So what we do is we measure the force as a function of the extension and calculate back on the contour length. And now we know we have something that's that long extracted when we reached one of these barriers, then this is the length of this thing, then we know this is amino acid so and so much where this barrier is located. Now we can calculate back on the barriers with the precision of something like two amino acids. Now we can go through the complete unfolding pattern and we can now localize for each of these curves the barrier that actually resists unfolding. And what you see is then that these barriers are on different parts of the protein. Now it's interesting that we have the chance to flip the protein over and approach the same thing from the backside. And our first thought, and that was really naive thought, was, well, now we approach the energy landscape from the backside. And each of these barriers we approach now from the backside. It was really nice to recognize how stupid it was. I really had to, lou to laugh loud about myself and obviously it's a much more complicated situation because when we, when, when we extract some of the protein, then we change the structure already. But what we now get is actually a completely different view of this unfolding process. It's an orthogonal view, and it's additional. And so what we do is we flip the thing the other way around, unfold it from the backside, and do exactly the same thing. And now what you see here marked is always the position where we find the barrier in the helix. Some of the barriers are at the ends in the loops, some in the middle. And now we can sum up that all in this one very crowded picture. This is actually the amino acid number. This is where it is in the membrane. And now here, each of these points here is a barrier that we find, either from the cytoplasmic or from the extracellular side, and the size here reflects roughly the height of the barrier. Now, interesting is we have certain spots where we have barriers actually from both sides at the same location. That means those are structural traps. That means, or one possibility is that this is really something like two hydrogen bonds, for example. If you approach it from this side, this one is already broken, but this stands. If you approach it from this side, this is broken, but this one stands. So doing this step for step for step allows us now to identify each of these barriers, 
And the real way to do it is then with molecular dynamics calculation, and this is what we do together with uh, Kultmüller. And what they do is, water isn't shown here, in complete water environment, measure the force that's needed to extract bacteriodopsin, and you get these weird profiles. This is still something which is in the, in the works, but we'll be able to identify then the barriers with each of these processes and the unfolding. What's that good for? No, a step in between. Now we come to the refolding. Wouldn't it be nice that instead of just only extracting that thing and destroying it, we would be able to assemble it, really fold the protein into the membrane, do the paste part. And that's actually doable, partially at least. So in the situation where we have helix CDE still intact, we apply load, stretch it, E and D come out and only C is left. This is now at that point here. And what we do is now we go backwards. And this is just offset to make it clearer in blue. Now we go backwards. And now what happens is that the force increases suddenly. That means that the protein is pulling the cantilever down. This means that the protein is doing mechanical work while it is folding back into the membrane against the cantilever. So that's neat. Now we can measure the force, not only, but also the work that is needed to unfold, but also can measure the force that the system does on the cantilever to fold back. And we can complete that several times to make sure that this is really nicely folded, all the criteria that there are steps in between, and, and, and. The important part is we can now measure, actually, the energy that's dissipated in this process. And now we can start testing fluctuation theorems. That's something that physicists are really thrilled about that the second law of thermodynamics that we've known for so long has actually gotten an extension through the Jardzinski's theory, which links now non-equilibrium processes with, I, I'm, this is, I'm flipping over this, no problem, which links non-equilibrium processes with equilibrium thermodynamic properties. And this is really neat. And the neat thing is now we have a biological system where we do physics with. I like that a lot, because often it's the other way around. You use physics to do an experiment in biology, but for the physics, nothing comes out in quotation marks. This is completely different. You can do these fluctuation theorems only on the small systems, and basically only the biological system allow you to program all the details into it that you want. And so this is nice physics doable only with biology. It's also worth doing it. And this is actually a beautiful experiment that Daniel Miller did in his experiment and that I learned will be actually, Paul Park wants to do that kind of experiments and, and uh, Andreas Engel also. And this is a beautiful experiment where what we discussed now is really employed. What they did is they took this protein and recorded the unfolding pattern, changed the conditions and learned, yes, if it's inactive, there is then a new barrier coming here, which blocks, obviously, the protein. But if you do inhibit it with drugs that are known to inhibit, the mechanism is supposedly a completely different. You get a new barrier, actually, in here. This barrier is in this loop, so the binding site for this drug is actually here, whereas this inhibition is something that occurs at a completely different spot. So this is doable on a single molecule, and the idea is now, obviously, expressing these proteins and throwing on molecules and finding out what are the interactions. And the nice thing is you don't need the structure of it. And I assume that this will be a really, really fruitful thing that these people will do. What have we learned? We can extract individual membrane proteins one after the other. We learn where they have actually barriers against the unfolding at positions where we hadn't expected them. We describe it pretty well. We learned that refolding against an external force occurs, and it's clear these systems are the ones that are really interesting. Bacteriodopsin is not an interesting molecule, but we learned all the physics on a molecule which is well-defined, where we have all the structural data and where we have all the mutations available. Let's come to the last point, molecular sensors. And that's a project which started actually already a few years ago with Titan and then was taken over by Elias Puchner. He became interested in the titan kinase. Again, in a nice collaboration with the group in London, Gerhard Frenzen and Matthias Gottel, and with the group in Göttingen, Frauke Greta and Helmut Gruppmüller. And you all know how muscle works and all these muscle machinery here. 
is well understood. But there are other molecules built in here which also have a really important role, and one of them is actually the titin, this molecule here which spans the whole muscle machinery. It's known to organize this muscle machinery, but also has very, very peculiar mechanical properties, what we learned something like 10 years ago now already. And what happens if you stretch such a titin molecule, this is the force versus the extension, then you get the zigzag pattern here. A very unusual pattern. A spring would look like this. Oops, a straight line. An entropy spring would look like this. But this is something completely different. It has completely different mechanical properties. And nice thing is we understand how it works. If we do a recombinant constructs of uh, Ig domains, one knows how the titan is built up. There are Ig domains, fibronectin domains. Then you see exactly this pattern. And now you can start measuring what that is. What happens is that actually each of these peaks reflects the unfolding of an Ig domain. This molecule is actually a tandem repeat of Ig and fibronectin domains. So if you pull on it, what happens is that one of these domains actually opens. I hope this is not too precious. We make a titan molecule so that you see how that works. So this, those are the Ig domains. I'm just folding titan now. And so again, we have a polymer. We force is increasing, fluctuations are getting, uh, are getting smaller. And now what happens is one of these domains can't hold it anymore. And we have an additional length fl uh, fluctuations and so on. So one after the other, blop, blop, makes this peak. So this is this pattern here. This is this here. And we learned the distances here uh, coincide nicely with uh, the length of them and so on. So we understand this pattern. What's that good for? Well, think of what happens if a muscle is locally damaged. You've been playing soccer and somebody was really rude and, and, and kicked you, and so the muscle is really sore at that point, it's bad. Well, from the engineering point of view, you would say muscle is a badly engineered thing in any way, because what you have is these machines here hooked in series and in parallel. This is a very nonlinear interaction that occurs. So from the engineering point of view, controlling something like that is a mess. This can have only evolution being done. So <laughs> the the solution to it was Mother Nature built other devices into the muscle to protect it. And actually, if you just think of you have an isometric contraction of something like this here, then those muscle cells, which are in good shape, they will contract, and this guy that was damaged is actually now suffering the load from the others. So eventually, that will be pulled apart if not a safety belt prevents it from doing so. And that's actually tightening. That's one of the functions acting as a safety belt. So this muscle here is not rupturing by the action of the neighbors, but it doesn't really help. It also needs some repair. So it needs some sensing that the force is not as it should going through myosin actin bridges, but it goes through the titan. And the best thing is you build a force sensor in here somewhere that feels, ah, force is acting on titan. Something's bad. And exactly there you find the kinase, the titan kinase. And now, we understand, meanwhile, also uh, what the function of titan here is. It dissipates the energy if needed. And this titan kinase, that was hypothesized that this might act as a force sensor. The way it is built into the titan is it is actually at the C and at the N terminal end linked to this thing. So the force goes through the molecule and it has a catalytic center in the middle, which is covered by actually these lobes here. It's auto-inhibited. So nice thing is, if you look at this thing here now, and you have the x-ray structure and everything, then what you see is a protein which does not work. So you have to make it working. Mother Nature wor makes it working by acting with forces on it. We should do the same thing in order to find out if we can do the same thing. It was shown that it is involved in the protein turnover for muscles. So if this is activated, then yes, it would be a machinery that helps to regenerate the muscle. That was nicely shown by them. And so if we now start looking at the mechanics and at the energetics of it, this is the titan kinase together with its neighboring domains. What we do is we stretch now the whole thing and just record what happens. This is what you learn. These, you'll recognize those are the Ig domains that we know already from the titan. The stuff in front here, that's the titan kinase that unfolds. Now if you look at the energetics, this is if you integrate force times distance, over this curve here, then this is the energy that you dissipate in this process. Then you see in this range here, it's 1,700 kTs for four domains. 
think that a covalent bond is only on the order of 100 to 200 kT, and you learn to appreciate how really nicely designed this titan is as a safety belt, because it dissipates all this energy tenfold the energy that a covalent bond has without rupturing. It just dissipates it, makes heat out of it, that's all. So that's wonderfully done. If you now look here, then the titan kinase itself requires to unfold on the order of 190 kTs. That would not be a good thing for a sensor. KT is the unit of thermal energy at room temperature in this case. So we have here, we, need, we would need 200 thermal energy units, that's way too much. A hydrogen bond is on the order of five to 10 kTs. But what we have here in the first part here, in the activation step, that's on the order of 30 kT. That's neat, that's, that's decent for, for a force activation as one would expect. So one would expect indeed here in front the step that activates the titan kinase and then this the signaling. And so like the dynamics calculation in the Göttingen group, they actually suggested that First, it's this helix here that covers it that is opened, and then second, these beta sheets here open upon force activation, and then the thing here becomes accessible. If that's true, then we should be able to measure that, because if the catalytic side is opened, ATP should be able to bind to the catalytic side, and then as a the next step, the kinase activity comes. So we go back to the experiment, do our nice pattern of unfolding peaks for our titan kinase, and there is no ATP present. Then we throw in ATP, and what we find is that a second class of curve appears, and this has an additional barrier here. Everything else stays the same. So what we can do is we can count now how many cases are that we find a barrier, and how many cases had no barrier at a given concentration of ATP. What we do is a mechanical titration experiment with a single molecule. And we just ask the probability if we have so and so much ATP present, and we open now the door for a certain time because we can vary the speed at which we actually open this. So we open the door, wait a certain time, let ATP bind, probe afterwards whether ATP has bound or not, if we find this peak. And if we measure these times and if we measure these numbers, we have everything what we need to fully characterize this enzyme. And one can do so, one can write down the master equations. That's actually a nice example. Master equations for probabilities are much simpler on the single molecule level than on the ensemble. So many things become simpler if you do them on the single molecule level. And if you do so, then you can, uh, when you vary now the, the, the rates at which you do it, get this curve and get all the three constants, the kinetic constants and the static constants. And to convince yourself that this is really meaningful, it's clear one has to find out where is the binding site for ATP on the structure? And unfortunately, there is no crystal structure with ATP available. But what they did is they looked for structural homology and other kinases where this is known and identified this as the putative binding pocket, did a mutation there, and sure enough, same experiment, but basically double the speed of the off rate, everything else stays pretty much the same. So one can probe the binding pocket mechanically. It's a mechanical pump probe experiment. How does this evolve now our picture of the titan kinase? Well, we start with the auto-inhibited conformation. The rupture of the beta sheet is most likely what we see here as this peak here. And this is then the rupture of the second one here, or the, the opening of the second one here, making the ATP accessible. And this is then ATP bound. This additional peak here is the ATP bound in the binding pocket. This picture is actually at the moment being made much, much more precise and clearer with a full molecular dynamics calculation in Helmut Gruppmüller's group. And this is a really weird picture. Uh, the only thing I would like to point out is one can calculate that without and with ATP, there is a significant difference in one of these barriers that molecular dynamics calculation sees in exactly this process. So we're about to localize each of these barriers in each of these steps and molecular dynamics calculation and uh, the uh, experiments, they converge pretty nicely. This is the simulation, this is the experiment. Simulation sees one peak more than we see, but that, has, that might have to do that we're insensitive and that the geometry is different. What have we learned? Titan acts as a safety belt and actually is nicely suited to dissipate lots of energy without rupturing. Titan kinase acts a force sensor, it's 
actually at a force imbalance of 50 picanewton activated. And it's clear where we go. We will solve the further steps of the PK activation. Now the question is, how am I doing in time? Mr. Chairman. You are fine. I'm fine. That means? You can go for a I can go for a <laughs> 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 Thanks. <laughs> then <laughs> Then why don't, I, why don't I add a little nice story just for the sake of it for the physicist? The <laughs> for you, it might be a sacrilege to, to, to use a molecule for something completely different. But in physics, this is just fine. We were sick, uh, with, when we had these experiments and learned now how a, a force sensor works in Mother Nature, we were thinking, well, how would we build a force sensor and w how can we use? We can't really read this, this phosphorylation. No, no big deal. What we can read is fluorescence. That's pretty simple. So can we actually make a force sensor that reports fluorescence as a function of the force? And so the idea was actually, can we teach a lipase to measure forces? Because there are lipases that have pretty nice fluorescent signals. And if we modulate, mo modify them and make handles on it, is it probably possible to use that as a sensor? And that's a project, Kerstin Blank, Hermann Gump, Julia Morphe, and David, and Ralf David, they're pushing that forward. And that's a lipase. It's meant to do uh, all kinds of other uh, enzymatic reactions, but it can be fooled by the substrate, which is a carboxyfluorosine diacetate. And the lipase cuts away one of these groups, and the product is now highly fluorescent. That's the binding pocket. That's all pretty well studied. The nice thing is this is a mo it's one of these molecules that has lazy and active cycles. We find that now in more and more enzymes that they're not continuously active, but they have states in which they have really bursts, and then they're lazy for a long time. And then comes a burst again. And so each of these bursts that you see here is actually an enzyme at the surface, but goes through many turnovers. So it has on the order of 100 turnover in a window of that size. It's active or inactive. And the most simplest idea, which is obviously way too simple, is, well, let's assume it is something like a two-level system. Then the active and the inactive state actually are separated. And now, if we would be able to shift this balance, we could actually shift the activity towards the active state. So we could build a force sensor if we would be able to tune this energy landscape. Well, first of all, it's not at all a two-level two system. It is, if at all, then a multi-level system. It's a non-Markovian, yeah. It's a, a non-Markovian system. If you look at the normalized autocorrelation function on the logarithm of the time, then you see a broad distribution of time scales. So this thing has a very complex energy landscape. And it's better described. It's roaming around in an energy landscape. And some of these areas are active. Some of these are inactive. So that's a pr much better picture. But nevertheless, we can probably tilt the energy landscape and change this ratio. Now the idea is, can we have this guy? and? have him make a turnover and watch. And the idea would be, if we would squeeze a little bit, then we would increase the activity if this picture is right. But we have to prevent it from dying if the force is actually too high. And so it actually needs something like a force limiter. It needs something that ruptures if that force is exceeded. So we need a few tools on it. That's the lipase. We first added a handle to attach it to the surface with a SysTag. The molecule is still active after that. Then uh, we added a second handle. And this is actually a peptide at the other end. The peptide binds to, a bind, uh, to an antibody. It's a single chain antibody that we got from Plictoon's group. And this is covalently attached to the tip with spacers. And this is covalently attached to the surface. This actually holds to a force of on the order of 60 picanewton. If you stretch it, then it ruptures. And if you measure that length, you, this is basically the length of the spacer. So these molecules don't unfold in this process. It just ruptures. So we can apply a force. And this is limiting the force, this antibody complex. Now we can do an experiment where we have many of these molecules at the surface excited again in total internal reflection, come from above with a bead where we have many of these antibodies. So we can do many experiments in parallel while we apply a force. And if you do so, then you can modulate the force so the, 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 the antibody holds the, the, the protein. And we do now modulate the force on the order of 5 piconewton modulation. And this is then what you get as a background signal. But these spikes here, this is the activity of the protein. And if you now correlate the activity with whether the beat goes up or down or whether the force is applied to it or not, then you clearly see when force is acting on it, then it's more active. 
However, there is something which is much nicer. And this is that if you do the experiment now such that you apply these 50 picanewton and let it rupture, then what you have is you have a clock. You can actually start your molecule, and now you can count and can just wait what it's doing in time, because you can synchronize it with this external signal. You apply the force, and it ruptures, and that's on the order of milliseconds exact. And now we can watch what it's doing. And interestingly enough, the maximum of its activity comes something like four seconds after that process had happened. So what that means is we drop the molecule somewhere in confirmation space where it takes quite some time to find its path back to the active. So there must be a barrier which is pretty hard to overcome and which requires on the order of four sec uh, seconds before it goes to the active area. And from there, it can relax into the inactive area. Well, it's obvious where that can lead. What we can do is we can start actually now modifying these attachment sites and start learning again what we do to the molecule. We start learning why this time scale of four seconds is the dominating time scale and things like that. So if I'd like to summarize anything then, single molecules are far from being complicated. Tools are developed that allow you to handle single molecules and many things that make experiments with few molecules very complicated because you run in all kinds of number fluctuations become simple on the single molecule level. You have one guy, you get to know it, has its peculiarities, is probably lazy today, probably not lazy tomorrow, but you follow it in time, you have the record, and it's a completely different thing than if you have an ensemble with few molecules. So if you try to miniaturize, shoot for single ones. Thanks. That's a, that's a very good point. There are. First of all, in order to be sure that you grab only this end, the best what you can do is you put in cysteines at that end. Then you know that the interaction with the gold surface is localized. That has proven to be pretty precise. However, you can also do it completely non-specifically. And what you do is you allow the tip, the, the, this protein to adhere to the tip, and you don't know where it is. Now you record zillions of force traces. They will vary in length, because some of these traces, you grab the protein in the middle. So those will have only three, four peaks, and that's it, because you don't have the full length of the protein that you can stretch. Now you sort all these traces according to their length. And only the long ones are the ones where you've grabbed at the cytoplasmic tail, because only for the long ones you can stretch all the domains. And now you're sure that those are the ones. They may now vary by a few amino acids, but the whole pattern then varies by a few, a few amino acids if you, if you grabbed it in the middle or at the end of the cytoplasmic tail. You can shift this. Uh, two questions, if possible. So the first one is uh, uh, The first question is uh, connected with uh, bacterial lupsin studies. So uh, at least as far as I could see the map of barriers, uh, you mapped that the bar uh, some of the barriers are connected with tryptophans, right? Yeah. And they're at the interface, I mean the polar interface. Okay. Yeah. So the, in fact, uh, more or less this uh, hypothesis that the tryptophan anchored the, the, um, the position of, of the alpha helix is correct. Okay, and uh, my second question is uh, uh, connected to your first uh, part of, uh, of your talk about uh, this nice manipulation. Uh -huh. So um, as far as I could see from the uh, a magnitude of the forces needed for peeling and uh, shearing, they are not so different, in fact. It's something like 150 piconewtons, right? Yeah, correct, a factor two. Because that's, if you do a, a, thumb over the, uh, a calculation over the thumb, uh, you have energy to break these. You can do it this way, then, sure. in, yeah. then you have the length of the DNA on this energy. And you do it this way, then you have twice the length of the DNA on the energy. And so the forces should be a factor of two different. I mean, does this mean that, in fact, even in, in peeling, there is cooperativity between H bonds? Yeah, this is actually a process which is in thermodynamic equilibrium. They're breathing, they're going back and forth and back and forth. And even the picture that I showed, the shearing of the DNA, 
is way too simplified. Say all the hydrogen bonds are loaded in parallel. This is simplified. If you look carefully, then what happens in this process? You have bulge, bulge formations, you have bubbles, and it's a dynamic process. And these bubbles mi migrate, diffuse, and so this process is clearly much more complicated. I should have been more precise and say the energy required to separate these two strands is brought up in a much longer or much shorter lengths in one or the other case, and therefore the forces are different. That's the only thing one should say. Maybe if you have five minutes afterwards yes. to discuss this more, because I am really interested. Thank you. Great. There's a very quick question regarding your material adoption work. First one is, you know, when you have those individual unfolding, when you have those individual unfolding events in material adoption, do you have any information about transition states for those individual events? Are they, are, are they the same? Or we're, finding, we're finding more and more transition states. This is the, 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 more, the closer you look, the more detailed this pattern is. In the beginning, we had on the order of 20 peaks. Now we have on the order of 40, 50 peaks. And these transition states in between, there's something that are sometimes hard to catch because they're short-lived and require then also sophisticated tricks like approaching the transition state and then modulating the force and doing a lock-in amplifier uh, scheme or something like this. It is, I think, worth looking into more interesting systems. Bacteriodopsin, you're, you're very generous, and you, you don't criticize me for that when I go to other places and say, oh, bacteriodopsin. And then <laughs> I, don't, I don't really dare saying that. <laughs> and for physicists, for physicists, it's ideal, because we get all the details. And, and, and for finding out things like that, it's a good system. But there, there's so, so many interesting uh, proteins out there which are pharmacologically relevant, which are, for, from your standpoint, by your observations that with single molecule manipulations, in not that you can unfold, that's, mm -hmm. you know, that's trivial, but that actually you say, what you, what, if I understood it correctly, that you can reconstitute it back. Is yes. it a functional reconstitution? I'm really puzzled. Without any I've helper molecules? The only, thing, the only thing we can say is that if you unfold it again, it looks like it hasn't been unfolded before. That's the only thing you can say. We can't, we can't do, we can't do a, a functional reconstruction. But you, you don't have any kind of... We don't. Yes, so that's not unusual to expect that it will reconstitute functional. Well, it's a different process when you reconstitute from SDS and when you just you know, approach it to the surface. It's a good, it's a I have a two quick questions to you, if I may. The, the one is, do you, are you sensitive enough with your methods? Uh, of unfolding that you will see isotopic effect if you put in uh, D2R mm. or, uh, mm. or 18 water. We've tried. <laughs> yeah, we've tried. No, that, that's a, it's a good point. We've tried. No, we, we've about. tried. We've tried. And uh, we haven't done that uh, systematically. If I, call it, if I recall it right, I saw a graph from Julio Fernandez who did uh, unfolding of his ubiquitins in D2O, and there, there he saw a difference. We haven't done that systematically. Yes, it differs. You see differences. But it's, it's nothing that we've done systematically. And can we correlate, let's say, uh, like, uh, theoretically, maybe this hasn't been done yet, but uh, the affinity of a ligand to a target, how that affects, if you have five different ligands with different affinities, how that uh, reflects in the unfolding pattern, if, you, if there could be a, some theoretical or practical ways of discriminating that uh, affinity then? I can give you an indirect answer. What we do is uh, a second set of experiments where we, not where we don't use an AFM cantilever to measure forces, but where we use a symmetric setup of DNA constructs and measure the break of the symmetry by the interaction of a ligand. Imagine you have uh, two, of these, two of these unzipped structures, one behind the other. And in the middle, you have a fluorophore. If you pull, then the fluorophore will be the equal likelihood be up or down when they separate. But if on one of these branches you had the interaction with the ligand, that breaks the symmetry of where the dye will end up. And that's a very sensitive thing. And there you have sensitivity enough to quantify the interaction, for example, of uh, ATP interaction with, the, with an aptamer that is sensitive for ATP or copper with uh, DNA or things like that. In the ATP example, you can measure the ion in the offering. Correct. Thank you. You can measure the ion in the offering uh, for a single molecule. If you change, if you just increase the viscosity, you'll set up the situation where you're essentially measuring 
offerings without recombining. And so you should be able to rank uh, ligands of different affinity based on just looking at differences in offering. I, 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 would, I would agree, and I assume that you also would see the height of this potential barrier vary with the strength of the interaction of the ligand with the structure, because you would have to replace this, this, this ligand, and if that's weakly bound, right. then this would... Yeah. And so uh, I just wanted to um, ask about the manifold of, of conformational states that you're seeing in the lipases, for example. Um, if you go to uh, kinase literature, I, I think there's good precedent for biological control by uh, collapsing that manifold to a single very deep well in the absence of activating phosphorylation. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you've thought about looking at phosphorylated versus unphosphorylated versions of a kinase and, and then um, taking that the, the next step to uh, small molecule inhibitors where, again, you these may be functional, functionally inhibiting by collapsing that manifold to the point where you can't vibrationally access uh, the, the conformational space you need for activation. So that, that was my first question. This, this point is well taken, and it was, it was more a, a hint than a question that we should do this. We haven't done it, but this is clearly something that we should do. It's a, it's a very interesting approach. Uh, my second question was in the... Um, uh, the application of uh, building uh, discrete uh, assemblies, what do you think is the uh, probability that you can do that in a way where you could get multi-photon uh, epimer type of effects? So, um, for example, could you set up a system where you input sunlight around 500 nanometers and you output uh, IR uh, energy. I would, I would think that if you would do that with, qu with, with uh, quantum dots with, yeah, I, th I think if you use plasmon effects, you should be able to do it. In, in plasmons, what you do is you have your excitation wavelength, the plasmon uh, converts part of the, or, or goes down in the, in, the, in the dispersion relation, comes down at lower frequencies, and gives away some of the momentum to the, uh, to the gold particle. Now, if one actually does them right in, in the right combination to each other, then you actually can choose it. You, if you do it with gratings on, on metal films, then you can clearly uh, go in with one wavelength and come out with the fluorescence that is plasmon stimulated at a different wavelength. So I would assume that should be doable. If the efficiency is high, I don't know. I have no idea. The big problem of doing that in solution is thermal dissipation. But yeah. do you think you could limit that? I would, I would assume so. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't at least see why one shouldn't be able to really position them at the surface the way you want it. You, you seem to be. I, I'm likening this a little bit to Legos. You know, you're taking this apart, or at least stretching out this design that's been made with Legos, and then allowing it to come back. Maybe a slinky is a better metaphor for it. That you can take it out of its shape and then uh, use the the energy and the dynamics to put it back in the shape. Do you envision being able to reshape it by putting it back in a different structure? Now, eventually, one could potentially change it function that way, but can you reassemble it a different way and perhaps get a different function out of it? And the other question I have is, have you been able to utilize this to analyze RNA secondary and tertiary structures? Because that's a lot more difficult to predict. The, the answer to your second, uh, yes, we do work with RNA secondary structure. We have some ribozymes and riboswitches that we're in investigating. And that's a very nice and interesting system. We love it, but that's a completely different story. Force ranges are actually in the same ballpark. They're nicely accessible. RNA binds even stronger than DNA. And yeah, the first part, no, we have not that control that we would be able to manipulate the way the, B the bacteria adopts and folds back into the membrane. We're happy that it does. And it doesn't do it all the time. It actually does it in 10% of the cases. And in the other ca cases, uh, the drift just had the whole drift away or something else happened. So our control on this process is by far as good as one would need to have in order to change that. 
beyond finding out where the direct ligand protein interactions are, um, it seems obvious to me that this is actually measuring conformational differences. It can be, it, you don't know really what it's measuring. It's measuring molecular interactions, and that could certainly be, uh, you could be measuring uh, rips in intra transmembrane regions, for example? Absolutely. So do you envision this getting to the resolution where you can actually map conformational change, the, the points of contact that are important for conformational changes between receptors bound and unbound to ligand? To, this morning at breakfast we had this discussion, Andreas Engel and Paul Park and I, and the real bottlenecks seem to be having expression of uh, in proteins, suitable proteins, uh, in, in, in good quantities and, and, and purities and so on. This was at the moment the bottleneck. I think, do I quote you right? If that, if that, bottleneck, if that bottleneck can be solved, and, and this is probably then in your, ball, in your ballpark, if that bottleneck can be solved, if uh, proteins are available and experience is, is gathered with different proteins and, and one has, for, it, for example, I don't know, 10 mutants around the binding pocket, and then can just identify what does what, then one learns. And just, just for collaboration, can you actually calculate? Can you convert your pico-Newton uh, determinations and calculate a binding affinity? And what, does that binding affinity correlate with conventional methods for, for measuring a binding for the target under investigation? You can't, you can't convert this directly into a binding affinity. What you can do is you can, uh, in the example of the titan kinase, as it was shown, you can, by varying the rates, get the kinetic constants and the equilibrium constant. This is what you can do. I was, citing, I was citing this one paper, which I did not do myself, which Daniel Müller is the last author. I didn't do that experiment. In the, in the, case, of the, in the taste of, case of the titan kinase, it fits. There it's nice. There, there it fits. Okay, I'd like to thank Thanks.